Hello and welcome to Beyond Bosch. I'm your host, Jessica Dell. Before we get started, please be sure to subscribe and leave a review if you like this episode. Okay, let's get into it. Today, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, or as a lot of us know it, AI. And I'm so thrilled to introduce our guest today. Today, we have Zico Coulter. Zico is a chief scientist in artificial intelligence for Bosch Research and a faculty member in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University. So welcome, Zico. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you. So, I mean, obviously, I gave you kind of the everybody the brief intro of, of your title, but obviously there's much more to it. So could you give us a little more about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. So as, as you mentioned, I sort of have these two roles, right? I work at Bosch as chief scientist of AI there for Bosch Research. And in that role, I'm really looking to see where Bosch can apply and take these new developing trends in AI that I think we're probably all very aware of and see how we can kind of funnel these and focus these into products and into action at Bosch. But then I also have another role here, of course, which is my role at Carnegie Mellon University. And there I run a research group of about 25 PhD students, and we are really working at the forefront of AI. And it really is quite sort of detailed technical work. But what I love about this work in some sense is the incredibly short path we have between research, really blue sky, fundamental out there research, and things that start to affect everyone's life. AI right now, which I'm sure we'll get much more into, is, is this great, amazing field that has this very short turnaround time. And so what I like about the work I do, what I find so rewarding about it, is that we're able to kind of see things all the way from foundational new research all the way to deploy things that really make a difference in people's lives. Mm. That's really good. So I want to take us a step back for those who maybe are tuning in and are like, but what is AI? <laughs> Could you give us just that quick? What is yeah. it? How would you define it? Absolutely. So AI is an incredibly broad term. And it's actually, there have been a lot of different definitions of this term over the years. And I think none of them are really fully satisfying. So the definition I like for AI is that AI is the science of making computers do things that we think of as intelligent. All right, now that's almost a circular definition, right? I basically said nothing in that definition. I just said it's artificial <laughs> and it's intelligence, right? But that's actually the best way that I know how to define it because it captures the important elements there, right? It captures the fact that we're doing it with computers. So we're writing programs, we're developing sort of mathematical models that run on computers. And what we're trying to do with that is capture some aspect of what we associate and commonly associate with intelligence, uh, human intelligence, but really any kind of intelligence. Now, within AI, of course, there's a bunch of subfields that have, I would say, kind of taken on different levels of importance over the last several years. And a more specific, but also very important subfield of AI is the field I work in, which is called machine learning. And machine learning is a more well-defined term, right? So unlike AI, which is sort of everything related to smart computers, basically, machine learning is about building computer programs that learn from data and learn essentially from observing, in some sense, the world around us. And machine learning in particular, has been at the forefront of a lot of these advances you've seen. So if you've seen tools like ChatGPT or Stable Diffusion, these tools that can generate images and you know have conversations and things like this, these tools are based upon machine learning models. And so machine learning is a subfield of AI that is specifically about trying to build models from data and learn from data. And Keeping these two terms a little bit separate, I think is valuable because they're often conflated. I think when we talk about these things, as someone that works in both these areas, I sort of make it my mission to always define both these terms when I'm talking about AI. Yeah, that's very helpful. I think that's very, very spot on. So because you brought it up, chat GPT is quite a hot topic right now. Yes. Um, I'd love like, what is that in your definition? Yeah. and why does it work? How does it work? And there's some fear around it. There's a lot of a lot of both sides. Could you kind of get into that? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I, I kind of joke actually that my main job over the past year has been like the, or the since the start of the year rather, has been the chat GPT explainer because um, <laughs> this is sort of an amazing phenomenon that happened really. I mean, the models that underlie tools like chat GPT or stable diffusion, they've been around for several years and we've kind of all been banging the drum about how cool these things are and how impressive these things are. But something switched with the release of chat GPT and it kind of broke into the mainstream, right? And so all of a sudden now, now, everyone sees these things and to some degree doesn't really know how to contextualize it. I think a lot of people are still struggling to understand, you know, is this system as smart as a person? When we normally talk with another person on the internet, that's sort of the context we have. And it's sort of hard to differentiate exactly what this thing is that we're talking to. So let me give I would say the brief description, and we can then dive into any specific aspect you want. It's important to understand, first of all, what ChatGPT is before we dive into broader questions like, should we be scared of it? How do we use it? What's the future of these things, et cetera? Those are all sort of long, long questions. Okay, so first of all, the core of ChatGPT is a machine learning model. And it's a class of model known as a large language model, or sometimes also called in, in sort of a slightly broader context, a foundation model. And what this means is that ChatGPT is a model that predicts text. So what ChatGPT does is it looks at a sequence of text. And in the case of the, the interface you see, that sequence of text at first would be the text that you type in. So it looks at the text you type in, and then, it tries to predict from the text you typed, what is the most likely next word that would come after your question, okay? And the way it does this, and you can get into any level of detail here, sure. but the way it does this on sort of a high level is that it scours the entire internet to build what's called a large language model or a foundation model. And these things are machine learning models you can think of as just very, very big sort of sets of mathematical operations and kind of tables of numbers that when you feed in this sequence of words, predict basically what the next word's going to be. Okay, and they do that by having essentially a lot of sort of uh, knobs they can tune and a lot of sort of little sets of what are called parameters that they can adjust based upon what they've read on the internet. But more or less, they're scouring the internet. They're picking up on statistical correlations. You know, mm -hmm. if we've seen these three words before, what word comes next, et cetera, what's the most likely next word? And they use this to build a model of what's the most likely next word. Okay, Wow. so, so, so that's what they do. <laughs> yeah, go on. Before you go on, yeah, I'm thinking about like my neighbor recently asked chat GPT, write me a story with these random endings, like based on if robots took over the world and this, and it was like insane, this plot oh, line, right? It's insane. As someone that works in this area, it, it, it's insane to me too. So let me sort of actually finish the little story here. So the story is that it predicts one word at a time, but of course what you get from chat GPT is not just one word, right? It's many words. And so what you have really is you have your question and it predicts the next word, all right? And then it says, okay, well, this next word is the first word in your story about robots taking over the world. And then it just repeats this process. So it says, okay, given your question and the first word I generated, what's the next word after that? Again, mm. culling from the statistics of the internet as a whole. And it just repeats that and you know, keeps generating, okay, now what's the next most likely word? Now what's the next word? Now what's the next word, right? Until basically it's done. And it says this little special word that says, okay, I'm over now. I'm done generating my response now. That description, to be honest, does not do justice to the amazing results of this process. And I think what has surprised everyone, AI researchers very much included, is just how far you can get with that notion of word by word prediction of text. Because in some sense, to your point, right, Let's talk about a story. I, I asked to write a story about the robots taking over the world, right? If you look at the story that's generated in a very real sense for, you know, a good model, that whole sequence of words that make up that story is the most likely response to that question, or at least a very likely response to that question, right? If it generated garbage, that wouldn't be very likely. That would be very unlike the text on the internet. And so what's amazing is the degree to which this paradigm of just predicting likely responses generates things that are incredibly realistic 
and simulate what we think of as ordinary conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's, <laughs> and it's like, I like how you're breaking it down because for someone like me who's super not tech, I am not technical. I'm more of a creative mind. And so I'm like, I can now visualize exactly how it's working. And that was really helpful for me personally, hopefully those listening too. <laughs> and kind of going into some of the questions that I know come up around it, like you just said, some of these obviously could be really long answers, but like the fear of that, okay, that's a very likely response, very realistic, very human response. What does that mean for humans in the workplace? What does that mean <laughs> for, you know, traditional jobs that are done by humans? You know, I know that's a question I think we need yeah. to address. So to be fair about this, no one knows, right? So, so no one has the actual answer to this. And there are wildly different opinions on this. There was an article in the New York Times, I think, over the last couple of days from Noam Chomsky, basically saying that because the systems operate in this way, they can never really be human. They can never really be as truly intelligent in some sense. I, I don't agree with him, to be very clear there. My philosophy here is a much more empirical one, that if a system is generating content that seems indistinguishable from intelligent text, at what point does it matter whether it's like a human or whether it's generated in some other way? It almost doesn't know. but. To get to your point, what are the implications of this on the workforce and on our day-to-day -day lives going forward? Because I think there is this understanding that these things are going to affect our lives going forward. My personal opinion right now is that we are not yet at the phase where these things can legitimately replace a large portion of what we as knowledge workers or maybe even more so as workers in the physical world can do. These models are incredibly capable, but they still work best or they work maybe only arguably in conjunction with a human guide, right? So they're left to their own devices in some sense, whatever that even means. I mean, we often ascribe too much agency to these things. I think that makes me a bit uncomfortable sometimes. They won't really do very much. What these things will be, and I think this is in the short term though, Short term, who knows how long that means there, right? That could mean even from 20 years to two years. But in this intermediate time where these tools exist are useful, the way they will become part of our lives is as tools for us, right? So there's this common joke. Um, people will now in the future write emails by writing bullet points. They will write a lengthy email to their colleague and their colleague will take that long email and ask ChatGPT to summarize that email into bullet points, right? So for some reason, we're gonna be communicating the medium of polite long form text, even though it isn't that useful. Right. Um, that's sort of a, you know, a very cynical view of the whole thing, I think. I think there really is value to the content that is generated by these systems when steered properly by humans, right? So these are incredibly powerful tools that in some sense, may be akin to the internet and think of it that way. I mean, the internet changed how we all did work, right? It changed how we got information, how we access information. I sort of see that these tools have the chance, at least the potential of evolving in a similar way, right? They are going to be sort of a front line for us to sort of generate content, for us to get quick feedback. And I think that could profoundly affect the way that we do work ourselves. Now, since I mentioned that, to make sure that I don't miss this point entirely, I do need to emphasize that right now and likely in the foreseeable future, there are going to be some substantial pitfalls of doing this, right? So these models, they make stuff up all the time, right? Because again, the way they work, the most likely response in text is not necessarily a factual one. And that's sort of a big problem with them. So at one point I asked ChatGPT to write a biography of myself and I'm a little bit on the internet, right? So, cause I, I have a university website and everything. So it, it actually knows who I am. It says, you know, Siegel Coulter is a professor of machine learning at Carnegie Mellon or something like that. Um, it doesn't know that's my boss role. Maybe it was trained before that was, uh, <laughs> it's data was from before then. But then it started making up completely false biographical information about me. Like I was born in Brazil. I was actually named after a, a soccer player. So that's, you know, from Brazil. And so it probably connected those two things somehow. And it just made stuff up. And if you didn't know this, if it wasn't about me, you'd have no idea what was true and what was false in this text. So we do have to be a bit careful about jumping headfirst and saying, okay, everything we do is going to be now just based upon ChatGPT. There are major limitations. And maybe this is probably, you know, maybe a response to a separate question here. But even with these problems, when used in the right way, this can be an incredible productivity and creativity tool 
that I think will enable humans working with these as tools to be much more productive and ideally creative and like have a brainstorming partner that is kind of with us at all times, right? That, that would be the ideal scenario here. There are worst case scenarios too, certainly. But to me, the future is about interacting with these tools and using them as tools to augment our own work. Yeah, yeah. Do you have an example of something that you would look forward to using it in that way? Yeah. So for me, the best example actually is coding. When I write code, you know, I spend most of my time coding, uh, looking stuff up on the internet. I'm looking at Stack Overflow. It's another website, by the way, that's changed entirely the way people do coding. I spend time looking up, you know, the right call in some library to do something, right? This is actually the majority of what I do is not like figuring out the underlying algorithm. It's like looking up and searching through other code about how to do something. ChatGPT is reasonably good actually at sort of taking descriptions of code that's out there on the internet and producing workable code that does something. And this is actually very, very powerful if done right. And there's also other tools like the GitHub Copilot that sort of integrates this more directly in the IDEs. But for these sorts of things, because I can in many times quickly verify that the answer it gives me is correct, right? I can try to run the code and see if it passes some simple tests that I'm trying to accomplish with this code. This is a case where it would take me much longer to look up and figure out how to do something myself than it would take to ask ChatGPT to do it and then verify that it gave me the correct solution or not. Or if it's wrong, then I, you know, then okay, in the cases that it's wrong, I go out and do it myself anyway. But as long as it's right a good fraction of the time, this is still a major time saver to me. I don't currently use it right now for much writing. It will probably get to the point where that will be a significant handicap. I'm old fashioned in this way, and I guess, and I just like writing. But one thing I notice is my PhD students, they use it for writing a lot, right? So they are starting to become kind of like chat GPT natives in that they use it for writing and for coding. And it's going to be a very valuable skill in that regard. I don't like the tone of its writing. I have to say it's very dry and boring and I like having a bit more of a voice, but you know, maybe at some point I can t tune it on my writing over all time and it would write in exactly an indistinguishable way from my voice. So those are the examples that I both see other people using it for and that I'm excited about. And the last one is just for fun. We don't quite make enough about this case because look, these things will transform work but another thing we do a lot as humans is we have fun, right? We like playing with things. And these tools are so much fun to play with, right? They let us sort of explore new ideas and new creativity in ways that we just, it's hard for us. I mean, so it's hard for me to write a poem or a story that I can tell to my kids about stuff. It's hard for me to my kids to write long form stories, right? But we can all start doing this in kind of an interactive way right now. And it's like a playground for sort of creativity in many ways. Same with the image drawing tools, by the way. So I really think that you know, part of why it is so popular, let's, let's just be honest, is not for the productivity gains we get from it. It's because it's so much fun to play with. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't ignore that. Humans like having fun. And the fun is not like a diversion. It, many times it's the point, right? And so that, that's going to be a big use case and remain a big use case, I think, for these tools. Oh, that's good. That's a really good point. I don't think a lot of people are talking about it like that. So there is an issue, an issue here that we really should talk about as well, which are the data and copyright implications of a lot of these tools. So let's be very clear. When we say that ChatGPT or Stable Diffusion or these other tools are built upon the internet, are trained on the internet, we, we really mean that. They scrape data rather indiscriminately from the internet and they use it to train these models. And they often do that without the express consent of the original content creators in many cases. And now you could argue this is public content. It's made freely available by the creators. People should be able to use it as they see fit. But that's debatable, right? Especially when it comes to these models that, for example, generate art and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, they are essentially copying styles and copying productions that other artists have created. Now, is this like a human learns from other artists? Or is this more like just copying a picture and redistributing your own version of that without the author's consent? This is still, frankly, to be decided. I think probably the truth lies somewhere in between, in my own personal opinion. But there are legal aspects of this that we have not yet resolved. They're still in limbo. Mm. The other thing I'll say, the other kind of 
ethical implication that a lot of the systems have relates to things like academic honesty and cheating. Let's just put it straightforwardly yeah. when it comes to tools like chat GPT. It is exceedingly easy to write an essay that meets all the standards of a high school or college essay on whatever topic you want without doing any actual work. And clearly, if it's just done indiscriminately, this is not the right thing to do. This is a violation of the standards of the class because when we are asked to write essays in most courses, we're not doing that to produce the content of an essay, right? We're doing it as practice for ourselves. The teachers certainly don't want to read uh, 30 essays, but they're willing to because they believe it to be valuable for people's academic development. And then same, by the way, it happens with coding too, right? You can easily pass an introductory to programming course using the outputs from ChatGPT or GitHub Copilot or these things. If that becomes abused and it likely is already being abused, we'll just be honest about it. That raises major issues about what's the future of education and authentication going to be. But then on the flip side, if these are tools that we are going to use in our future careers, to a certain extent, we should also learn how to use them and we should be educated about how to use them. So in some sense, there should be like two courses, right? There should be one course where you are absolutely forbidden from using ChatGPT for anything because you have to know how to write an essay. Another course where you have to use ChatGPT to help you write your essays because how else could you possibly know how to write essays using these tools for real work going forward without using these tools? So I think the future is going to be both these two things. I think we're gonna have to incorporate these tools into our, our coursework. And I say this very much from my own side because we're gonna have to do very much the same thing in computer science courses. But we need to appreciate too that a lot of our coursework is intended to be teaching without relying on these tools. Hopefully we will navigate this, right? So we navigated the introduction of the calculator. Students still learn how to add and multiply numbers, uh, despite the fact that they could easily go and do this. But they do it because, again, not because they are trying to produce the right answer, they're doing it for practice. And I hope that a similar ethos will evolve for these kinds of tools and they will be seen more like calculators and less like some magical right now they're so novel and, yeah. and they're, the possibilities seem endless that we're just tempted to use them all the time but the reality is i hope they evolve into something more like a, cal a calculator where you know when you should use it and you know when you shouldn't use it yeah that makes sense that's a really good analogy for sure yeah those are very very good points to bring up absolutely and i love that you're sharing we're in the midst of it we're still figuring it out right I mean, yes. su super important to know. <laughs> um, OK, so what's the latest in, you know, beyond chat GPT? What's the latest in thinking in like AI and robotics research right now? Yeah. And what are the next challenges you and other researchers are facing? Absolutely. So now I'll actually bring it back to a term I mentioned at the very beginning of this podcast, which was this term called the foundation model. The term foundation model, again, of which chat GPT is an instance, means a large model which is trained on a very large amount of data, usually from the internet, and then later on specialized to some new task. So ChatGPT is a great example because, you know, again, it's trained on the internet, but then when you ask the question, what you're really doing from a modeling standpoint is you are specializing this model to solve your given problem, right? This model can do anything, but you're telling it, no, solve this task. And that paradigm goes well beyond just language. There's a lot of data on the internet, right? There's, there's more than just text. There's lots of images, there's lots of video, there's lots of speech and audio. So imagine a problem where you sort of want to classify different things that could be in images. To use a very sort of work example here, you know, I, I imagine I want to sort of classify some parts on a manufacturing line as, as either being good or bad or something like this. That idea of using all the data we have on the internet, or maybe some private data as well, to train a general purpose model, kind of an open world model. And then at the end saying, okay, you can do anything. This model could classify any image, but I wanted to tell the difference between images of sort of good parts and images of bad parts, right? That's a very nice way of specializing these general purpose models to specific tasks. And that idea goes well beyond, as I said, language, right? So it can apply to images, it can apply to, to, to audio, you know, from these recordings, find the spots where there's a certain noise, a siren or something like that, and, and, a, long, and a long sequence of audio, right? In this long video here, find all the places where there's more than five cars on the road or something like this, right? These are all specific tasks that, normally speaking, 
we would have to train kind of brand new AI models for. So the way AI has worked for a long time is when we want to sort of solve some new tasks like that, we have to collect new data and train a new model and all this kind of stuff. And these foundation models, they are replacing this paradigm. And they're saying instead of doing this, instead of sort of developing AI models for each task we have, what if instead we build kind of one big AI model and then just specify, say in natural language, what task we want to accomplish? And the amazing thing is this really does seem possible now. This is the trend in machine learning. We're moving from specialized models for given tasks to general purpose models that can solve any task. Mm. Wow, I was just thinking about, wow, that'd be nice for the podcast editing to uh, train, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, train of, I started thinking about how I could apply that. Um, there, I love that. Yeah, there are all these actually really cool tools for like video editing and, um, and, and audio editing, audio studios that are coming out about this. And again, I think part of the best use cases of these things are not like in automating our emails, right? Then we get into this dystopian world where we write bullet points, translate right. large text that someone else summarizes as bullet points. But there's definite ways in which we want to be creative. We want to edit things. We want to sort of solve little problems. Hmm. And you don't want to have to train. I mean, not, not, not you in particular, but no one wants to train a machine learning model for each new task we want to solve, right? We just want to say, hey, take this long speech that Zico gave and cut out the important parts, cut out these good snippets and cut it into a 30 second teaser of this episode, right? That's possible. Like we have the technology that can do that and it's these tools will come. This is the thing I'm excited about, right? And, and in some sense, what I, I guess the, the last thing I'll say is that at a high level to me, this is about democratizing the use of AI systems. Right. So before to use an AI system, you know, someone had to develop a specific system for your task and then you just sort of click and use it for that one task, you know, classifying this type of image that, you know, cats and dogs or something like that. Just use right. a common example people use. Now with chat GPT or stable diffusion, you can tell AI systems what to do, right? You can build effectively what we all would have called your own AI system to do, you know, whatever you want to do in both, you know, software developers, but also just everyone are going to be able to create amazing tools with what we're producing here. Mm, yeah, that's really exciting. And I can I, I think everyone can feel your passion coming through when you just talked about that. That's really cool. So I do want to ask, how did you get into this? How did you fall into this line of work? Were you yeah. influenced by anyone, anything? So to be honest, like most things in life, I came about this through extremely lucky set of coincidences. I mean, this is typically how life works, right? You sort of fall right, into right. things that are they're just lucky. So I've, I've actually been working in machine learning for 20 years now. I was publishing my first papers in 2003. And so the way it happened is that in high school, you know, I, I started doing some programming because I enjoyed it. It was fun. I liked doing it. In college, actually, I, I wasn't planning to major in programming. That was something I sort of did, but I, I was sort of I was actually started off being a philosophy major, which maybe also speaks to why I like to philosophize about these things. But then, you know, I quickly decided this was the wrong thing. But I I started my course of uh, college courses a, a semester late. I mean, to be honest, I, I knew how to program, so it wasn't like I was having to catch up much. But yeah. I started the official course load a semester late. And so what that means is the professor teaching the first course I had uh, was different from the one that taught the first course for everyone else in the cohort. And this professor that I had as my first introduction happened to work in machine learning. And so I approached him afterwards and said, you know, what are you, what are you doing? His name was Mark Maloof, Georgetown University. And I asked him, you know, what are you, what are you doing? What sort of things are you working on? And he gave me the, uh, some machine learning problems to work on. And basically I started working on them. And I have, you know, I, I was able to actually, in fact, publish a few papers while I was an undergrad, get into a grad school program where I could then keep doing machine learning from there. And basically, I've never had to look back. So there's lots of hard work that goes along with it. I've, I've worked very hard at this, but really, you know, I, I would say life is like 90 percent luck and then doing the hard work to sort of uh, leverage it. Yeah. Because, I mean, if I had started a semester early, maybe I would have been working in some other field and not, not even, you know, not even done, done machine learning. Uh, I mean, of course, I should say also that, you know, that's what got me into the field. What has kept me in the field is the fact that I think this is the most exciting field that there has ever been possibly, right? And in, in, in sort of all science and all human endeavors, maybe you would say. That's, I know, an exaggeration. But what I find so amazing and so cool about machine learning is that there's this 
shockingly short turnaround time from foundational, you know, like writing an equation on a piece of paper to seeing a tool like ChatGPT affect kind of everyone, right? So the, the models behind ChatGPT, that's sort of the, the fundamental kind of math behind it was developed in 2017. That's not a long time for something no. to, I mean, take like anything else in engineering or science, like that doesn't happen very often that you have five years and really it's much less than that because these models were available quite a bit sooner. The rate at which we can kind of explore and figure new stuff out and then see that stuff deployed and see it frankly realized at companies like Bosch, right? See companies, large industrial companies look to apply these things and figure out where can we do these things. That is extremely rewarding. I, I got into the field maybe through luck, but what's kept me in the field is that I think it's the most interesting thing I can possibly imagine doing. I love that. That's awesome. I mean, I think that's lucky for you to have found, right? <laughs> yes, mean, very lucky. I do want to ask, I love to ask guests what their best piece of advice, and it could be personal career, whatever you want to leave the audience with. Do you have something that comes to mind? Yeah. So when, when you sort of ask me, like, like why'd you get into machine learning? Uh, I, I, I've kind of accepted a long time ago that so much of where we end up is controlled by factors well beyond our influence. And you know, we have a small amount of influence and certainly how our careers progress, all sorts of things. But a lot of what happens in our lives are, are sort of dictated by random luck. And I find it actually, in some sense, very uh, freeing to accept, and it, it's sometimes easy for me to say this because luck has worked out very well in my sorry, uh, case and I've had all sorts of privileges that have been able to, to create that sort of lucky scenario. But I still feel like appreciating that luck and not not somehow thinking that, you know, my situation is due to solely my ingenuity and hard work and, and, and all these things. But it is due to happenstance. Right. Accepting this has made me a much kind of happier person. Actually, I really actually enjoy the fact that, you know, I'm here by incredibly good luck. I'm incredibly fortunate to be here in this situation. And I think viewing it that way gives you a bit of freedom to. Be a little bit less concerned about alternative paths that you could and should have taken. Or when you, when you encounter many people who I'm sure, given the same opportunities as me, would succeed far more than me, be able to appreciate that and really try to help wherever you can, right? I, I really do think that it's extremely valuable to be able to sort of approach everyone that I interact with, knowing that we're all just kind of in some sense, bouncing around through lucky bounces, right? We're one of these marbles that are bouncing around due to luck. And I hope I can, you know, help give people uh, in the long term the same opportunities and the same chances that I was given. There are so many people, as I said, that could do far better than me had they been given those same chances. And so I want to to pass that along uh, to, to, to everyone else as well. I will also say that one thing that I've... And this is not the same as everyone, I think. But one thing which you've probably picked up on that does motivate me and that I like to sort of keep in mind with a lot of what I do is that for someone like me in research, right, or doing fundamental research for the most part, it's easy to look at the to, to focus solely upon kind of the impact we're having and the results of our work and what we are producing as a way of gauging our value, the worth of what we're creating. But I think also it's very important to just think about the enjoyment we get out of the work itself, right? So, so the reason why I'm in research fundamentally is that I just find it really cool. I love, you know, thinking about math. Or I really do. I, I, I like deriving proofs and like proving a mathematical fact and then seeing that fact like implemented in code. And it's amazing. And I think it is good to put a weight as much as we can. And again, with all the caveats here of this is a luxury that I have and it's something that I hope to give to others, but which is not certainly available to everyone. But if, if luxury is available uh, to, to, to you, I, I really hope that just doing things that are fun and that are rewarding, not for their end effects, but for mm -hmm. for the thing itself, the little bits of reward that we get along the way for doing that. And then what makes it really fun is the interactions you have with people that are sort of working toward these same goals. That's the thing that I find kind of most rewarding about this job and about the roles that I have. I love that. I think that is a message we all need more fun, right? Right yeah. now, I feel like 
We've lost a bit of our fun. <laughs> yeah, and again, it is, and you know, to come back to the point that I was mentioning about the, the, this value in ChatGPT, right? Like, you know, you know, Bosch's, Bosch's uh, motto is invented for life, right? Ultimately, we are doing things for life. And, and, and what does life mean, right? Well, well, life is about personal connections and fun and all these things. And so the more you can imbue this into the work you do, I think the more the end effects of it reflect that same ethos and those same ideas. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. That's awesome. Well, Zico, this has been amazing. This is such a rich episode. I almost feel like we need a second one down the road because like I say, I, I can talk, you know, we want to talk about AI killer robots and stuff like that. I can talk about that too. And <laughs> <laughs> those scenarios also and and what it means to be intelligent and those kinds of things, which are great questions. But right. but uh, yeah, like I say, I'm I'm the chat GPT explainer these days is my yeah. is my chief role since the start right. of the year. So I'm happy to talk <laughs> as much as needed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Is there anything you want to leave the audience with or that we didn't get to that you really wanted to? Let's see. Um, I guess it would be good at some point to also shed a bit of light on why I'm excited about these things in the context of Bosch in particular. I know this is a general yeah. episode, but I'm extremely excited about what we can do here at Bosch with these things, right? Because I think that there's some really amazing features both with the use of these tools internally and in products and going beyond that, thinking sort of more broadly about how can we take this idea of building large open world models uh, that kind of do anything that people want to do and imbuing that more in the products we develop at Bosch, right? Because I think there is this potential longer term maybe to have AI not just be something that sort of exists on the internet, but something that exists in embodied form in all the devices, all the things that Bosch makes, right? And I don't mean for its own sake. We don't need to have chat GPT on a hairdryer or, or chat GPT in a spark plug. That's not going to really do much uh, there, but there is a sense in which if we build products that integrate some amount of AI, either in their production or in their end use, there are so many cool things we can make. We've only scratched the surface. Because so far, our interaction with AI has largely been through these virtual interfaces, right? Typing into things. We haven't even scratched the surface of what's going to be possible when we think about AI being in devices around us. It may be in more or less limited forms, but being in all the things that we use day to day. And part of the reason why I'm so excited about the potential of Bosch for this is that Bosch is a company that builds things, right? We build stuff that people use, and as the motto goes, we build stuff that we want to improve people's lives. And I believe that AI and integrating AI into stuff in the world represents a huge untapped potential for these kinds of tools. And I don't even know the right use case yet. I, I don't know what all these use cases are, but the same way that ChatGPT only sort of reached its true level of impact once people started playing with it, right? Once people started realizing what you could do, I think the true potential will come when people start just thinking about opening up what's possible with physical devices and starting to play around, for lack of a better word, with AI in these systems. And I find this incredibly exciting as a, as a potential going forward. I love that. Okay, so if you're listening to this, go have more fun. Start playing with ChatGPT. How could somebody go start playing with it, by the way? Oh, I mean, you, you just log on to chat.openai.com, or I guess, yeah, you have to sign up for an account there. You also have to hope that servers aren't busy, which is unusual these days. Now, there's also, you know, right now, don't submit like sensitive information to it, right? So do it mainly for fun, actually, right now. That's that should be the main use case is fun, not because, you know, I mean, you're, you're sending your data to a third party company right now, right? So don't use it uh, for any sensitive information or for really crucial things, but go ahead and play around with it interact with it, have fun, get a sense of what's possible from these things, especially with the context of how these things work, right? So knowing what, what it's doing is it's generating text word by word, it gives you a real appreciation about how powerful these tools are and what kind of useful tools they could be. Most people that play with it get hooked quickly. When used properly, it's great to sort of have fun with interacting with these tools. Yeah. Absolutely. I love it. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us, Zico. And I can't wait to see what you're up to next. Great. Thanks so much. Great to be you're here. Welcome. Thanks for listening to Beyond Bosch Podcast. In case you missed our other episodes, now's your chance. Go back and take a listen.